Good morning. Good to see you all here again on another beautiful Lord's Day. We want to welcome you here to our services at the New Troy Grace Brethren Church. We want to uh, welcome all of you from internet land, from Facebook and YouTube as well, who may be joining us this morning. You need to look at just a few announcements. <clears throat> again, we will be uh, finishing up our study in 2 Kings for um, looking at uh, that last chapter in verse 4 where it talks about the poisonous stew. Um, and uh, that will be our last study in that and then we will move on to chapter 5. Um, it's just great to uh, be back here this morning. Uh, it's been a busy week. We had a district conference yesterday, and uh, it was a, a very uh, enjoyable time. Uh, a little bit of work for me, being moderator and also the host pastor of the church here, but uh, it's well worth it. Some prayer requests, continue to remember Sister Nancy Knapp. She had an MRI um, on her shoulder. I did not hear the results on that. Uh, I called to find out and I didn't get any answer or any call back, so I'm um, sorry about that. Uh, I do have an update on Dennis Castro. Flo said she took him in to the wound clinic again and they uh, cleaned up his wound again and he uh, is getting better. But she said he's still, still really struggling. He sleeps most of the day and keeps her up most of the night, so please remember Denny and Flo Casso, especially Flo for strength. Continue to remember uh, Carol and Jim Stuckey, Curtis and Joyce Smith, uh, Brent Sherry Galaro, Joe De Rossi, Mrs. Hine Luella, and her son Ray, and America Schmaltz. All right, this morning we're going to do part two of Liberating Promises. Looking at uh, verses 2 and 3 of chapter 1 of 2 Peter. Before we do that, let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you again for this Lord's Day. Truly, this is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Just be with us now, Lord, as we look into your word for these few minutes, that your Holy Spirit would enlighten us and encourage us and uh, teach us all things. We ask in your precious and holy name. Amen. I have a little story to share with you before I get into my message this morning. Again, it's one I think I shared before, but it's been a few years. Hospital regulations require a wheelchair for patients being discharged. I think we're all familiar with that. However, while working as a student nurse, this nurse found one elderly gentleman already dressed and sitting on his bed sitting on the bed with the briefcase at his feet, who insisted he didn't need any help to leave the hospital. After a chat about rules being rules, he reluctantly let the nurse wheel him to the elevator. On the way down, she asked him if his wife was waiting for him. I don't know, he said. She's still upstairs in the bathroom, changing out of her hospital gown. <laughs> yeah, maybe she should have uh, checked a little closer on that. All right, this morning, as I said, we're going to finish up the second half of the message I began last week. So this morning, it'll be Liberating Promises Part 2, and we're going to look at verses 2 and 3. Last week, we looked at verses 1 and 2. So if you have your Bibles, your swords, please uh, take them and follow along with me as I read these two verses. And I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible. Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his, his precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. 
Again, some very pointed words from the Apostle Peter. So we look at these two verses. Let's look at it in three parts. First, the goal is that we obtain life and become godly people. Secondly, the source of this life and godliness is divine power. And thirdly, the means by which this power produces this life and godliness is through knowledge of God. So first of all, the goal, life and godliness. First Peter is aiming at two things, eternal life and godliness and moral and spiritual transformation now and hope for life in the age to come. We will find out in chapter 2 just how deeply he is concerned that some in the church are living very corrupt lives. And there is a close connection for Peter between godliness and eternal life. You can't have one if you reject the other. In chapter 2 verses 19 and 20 he said this about the false teachers. They promised them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a man, to that he is enslaved. For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and they are again entangled in them and overpowered, the last state has become worse for them than the first. In other words, if the way of godliness is rejected, so is the hope of eternal life. So Peter forbids us to turn our faith into a fire insurance policy for escaping hell while our lives remain unchanged. The hope of life and the way of godliness stand or fall together. I remember years ago, many, many years ago, when we used to take our young people to skating parties, roller skating parties, uh, on one occasion, I remember very well, there was a youth pastor from one of the churches in St. Joe, I won't say which one, and uh, he gave a devotional to, the, to the, children, the kids there, and these were teenage kids, and I was very dismayed. He made no challenge to them to live godly lives. His whole thrust of his speech his sharing was, well, you need to get saved. So if you walk out of, out of the uh, church here or the, the skating rink here and get hit by a car and killed, you'll go to heaven. That, that's what he presented Christianity salvation as. It was just a fire escape from hell. No challenge to live godly lives uh, for, for the Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. I told Brother Don Glasky about that, and Brother Don, uh, he was not real happy to say the least. Well, the source is divine power. Second, the way of godliness and the hope of eternal life do not lie within our own power to produce or attain. Therefore, Peter says, God's divine power has granted us all things that pertain to or lead to life and godliness. This is a humbling sentence. When it comes to life and godliness, we must have everything provided for us from outside. Of course, this does not mean we are passive. As Paul says, work out your salvation, for God is at work in you. That's Philippians 2.13. But it does imply that we could never be godly or attain eternal life if we do not rely on divine power. We need to pause and stress this. The Christian faith is not merely a set of doctrines to be accepted. It is a power to be experienced. It is a tragic thing to ask people if they know the Lord and have them start listening to the things they believe about the Lord. Brothers and sisters, Believing things about Jesus Christ will save no one. James tells us in 2, 9, chapter 2 and verse 19, 
that the demons are the most orthodox believers under heaven. He said that you believe in one God, you do well. The demons also believe and tremble. It is divine power that saves. And if the power of God does not flow into your life and make you godly, you are not Christ. Romans 8.14, Paul says, All who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. The mark of sonship is divine power. And the mark of power is godliness, which means a love for the things of God and a walk in the ways of God. And Peter says that divine power has been granted to us. Who is us? Verse 1 says, those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours. We looked at that last week. Power is given to those who rely on Christ's righteousness. But how is this power experienced? How does it become active in our lives? That is the third part of verse 3. Through the knowledge of him who has called us to his own glory and excellence. As in verse 2, grace is multiplied in the knowledge of God. So in verse 3, divine power is granted through, through the knowledge of God. This gives us a good definition of grace. God's grace is a free power that works in us for our good. And the way it becomes active in our day-to-day -day life is through the knowledge of God. And the one fact about God in particular that, quote, He called us to His glory and excellence. But this is not a mere fact about God if you know it as applying to yourself. It is power. If you are a prisoner of war in a concentration camp, you've lost hope. You've thrown your morality away, thrown it out the window. And you learn that a prisoner exchange is being planned. And you see a guard coming down the road, pointing to individual prisoners and calling them to follow him to freedom and family. It is not a mere piece of knowledge when he points to you and calls you. It is power. The power of hope surges through your body because you know you have been called. So when Peter says that divine power for hope and godliness flows through the knowledge of our call to glory, we can feel what he means. If we could but see the glory and excellence of God and know that our Creator has approached us and said, Come, I'm going to show you my glory and give you my eternal life to enjoy it. That would mean power. The power of hope and the power of godliness. You know this from experience. When you see the glory and excellency of God most clearly and know He has set His affections on you, that is when you have power to live as you ought. Next, the means or the knowledge of God. Finally, in verse 4, He says, By which His glory and excellence... He has granted us his precious and very great promises that through these you may escape from the corruption that is in the world because of passion and become partakers of the divine nature. This verse is a restatement of verse 3. The same point is made, but the knowledge and godliness of verse 3 are interpreted for us in verse 4. The knowledge that leads to life and godliness is said to be the knowledge of God's precious and very great promises. And so we learn that the only knowledge of God that carries saving power is promising knowledge. The knowledge of the glory and excellence of God, in verse 3, gives power for godliness only if it communicates to us the happy promise that we are called and included. To illustrate this, if after a week of rain, 
A saddened child wakes up on Saturday morning and sees the glorious sunshine calling him to play outdoors. New power flows into his spirit, but only if he can go outside. If he were sick and couldn't play, the beauty of the day and the fun of his friends outside would make him miserable. The knowledge of the glory of God must be promising if it is to carry power. We must know it and believe that we are included, that the promises are ours, that they call to us. Paul uh, clarifies that in Ephesians 1.19. Then notice that just as in verse 3, the knowledge of our call to glory and powers for life and godliness, so in verse 4, the promises of God liberate us from corruption and give us a share in the, in the divine nature. The godliness of verse 3 is spelled out for us, negatively and positively. And there are two things that we need above all others. One, to be liberated from the power of sin that corrupts and destroys our life. And two, to be united to God in His likeness. As Paul states in Ephesians 4.23, and God teaches here what we so desperately need to know, that this liberation from sin and likeness to God come by knowing and trusting His precious and very great promises. Now very practically, I think this means we must day to day go to the Word of God and search for our great promises. Fix one or two of them in your mind and hold them there before you all day. And use them to overcome temptation to sin and incite you to acts of righteousness and love. Notice in the last part of verse 4 that corruption comes by passion or lust or desire. This means that the battle against corruption is fought on the field of our desires and passions. Sin makes its attack by holding out promises for us, for our happiness. The devil does this all the time. He says, if you lie on your tax return, you will have more money and be happier. If you divorce your spouse, you will be happier. If you cheat to win the game, you will be happier. If you don't upset your relationship with your neighbor by sharing Christ, you will be happier, and so on, and so on. And sin will always win the battle unless we have the carrot of God's promises hanging clearly in front of our noses. Unless we enter our day armed with one or two precious and very great promises, we will be utterly vulnerable to temptation. But if we hold before our eyes the astonishing things God has promised us now and in the life to come, His divine power will be present and we will escape corruption and be conformed to the image of His Son. Therefore, I urge you, search this book for the very great promises of God and hang them like a carrot in front of your eyes so that they lure you away from sin and toward the likeness of God. If you've forgotten that little illustration about the carrot, this was something they used to use to get a, a stubborn mule to move. They would take a carrot and tie it around his head with the thing and hang it about that far in front of his nose. And he would just keep going forward trying to get that carrot because he never could reach it. And when, when they, they uh, got the, the mule to do what they wanted him to do, they let him have the carrot. They weren't that mean. But that's the old carrot and stick uh, illustration. He, they got more with the carrot than beating the animal with a stick. Lastly, let me sum this up. We can sum up these first four verses of 2 Peter with four words. Power. Promises. Practice and prospect. God's divine power, in verse 3, flows into our lives when we know 
verse 2, and trust, verse 1, his precious and very great promises, verse 4. And this power flowing through these promises produces practice of godliness, verse 3, and the prospect of life eternal, also verse 3. So let us pray and commit ourselves afresh to see this power. I remember years ago working at, I think it was still Bendix Allied Signal, and I don't think it had, we'd been bought out by Bosch yet. But I, I was working in a department that I was really struggling. And I finally said, Lord, help me. And before I would um, leave for work, or before I went in to punch in to go to work, I would read a couple of verses and spend a few minutes of prayer with the Lord, asking him to help me, to give me power over, over temptations or over, over things that came up. And boy, did God ever answer those prayers. Usually the minute I walked into the department, something would happen that normally would have gotten me all flustered and upset, but because I had spent time with the Lord, I was at peace and able to fight off those fiery darts of the devil with that shield of faith. It's very, very practical and it works, folks. God does not lie. He does not tell us one thing and then do another. Let's close in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you again for this Day, I thank you for your precious word found here in 2 Peter. I just pray, Lord, that you would take these words and burn them into our hearts and minds, Lord, that we would learn to read and study your word, to get the knowledge of you that we need, that the practical knowledge, and then apply it in our lives to allow the Holy Spirit to work through us, to give us the power to fend off the fiery darts of the, the wicked one and to keep our testimonies and our, and our lives pure and clean before the world and before you. We ask in your precious and holy name. Amen. All right. It's been great being with you again. So until next week, this is Pastor Bob Mensinger saying goodbye for now. And we hope to see you next week, same time, same station. Uh, have a good week. God bless you.